Sciences for the year 2016, and we have once again on the top oral surgeon sitting next to me, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, one of the finest three surgeons we have with us, Dr. Ajay Roy Chaudhary, a very close friend for last 28 years since my MDS days from our Institute of Medical Sciences. We did our senior residency together. And today we have him as our chief guest. We welcome him today as our chief guest in this August program. Dr. David Toro has been always very kind to come and not only give lectures, but give live demonstration. Last time, we had a collaborative program on orthognathic surgery where we had excellent interaction of the patients, the PGs, and he was working and live surgery. Today, he'll be working on advanced surgery. May we invite the Honorable Chief Guest of the day, Dr. Ajay Roy Chaudhary, who's Professor and Head, Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Roy Chaudhary is an astute clinical surgeon and a researcher. He's a member of the prestigious Clinical Epidemiology Unit AIMS under INCLAN. Dr. Roy Chaudhary is the international faculty for the prestigious AOCMF and he has conducted over 20 workshops on the principles for AOCMF. Some people are born great, and sometimes greatness is entrusted on them. And this is one instance. I told Maninda that I'm not a chief guest kind of material. Please don't call me. But then he insisted. Daya Shankar insisted. So ladies and gentlemen, here I am. And it, it gives me immense pleasure to come to this university. The moment I enter this place, some, some wonderful vibes started coming in. Yeah. And I knew that this is a place which is going to go far, far away and far, far ahead uh, in, in future. Life surgical workshops are always, always uh, one of the star attractions of a conference. Yeah? What happens is that you get involved in the, in the live feeds which are coming in. The surgeons are explaining from there. The adrenaline rush which happens in the operation theater is actually passed on to the audience and you feel exactly one with the with with the with the surgeon and you get to know the complications which are happening the decisions which you are thinking and it is a it is a split second decision which they make over there and you you get involved in that it, it is exactly like uh, akin to akin to when you are driving um, when you know driving and when you are sitting with another driver before he would put a brake in a traffic situation, you would also want to put a brake, although you're not driving. So this is how you get involved in that kind of surgical procedures. And this is, this is all possible because the technicians who are working at the back hand, you know, who are bringing the live feeds, who are, being, who are mixing the camera angles to give you absolutely lifelike uh, uh, experience when you're, when you're sitting and, and concentrating on the feeds which are coming in. So their role is not, uh, is, is, is probably uh, probably uh, very, very important in, in these situations. So you know that these, adva and, and, and workshop like this will expose you to new horizons and you, s you will see as to where you can go. And our specialty, the oral maxillofacial surgeons are increasingly claiming stakes to the surgeries, which probably belong to, the ma to this specialty, but the other specialty had made their domain. And we are increasingly doing that and sticking our claims in, in, in these kind of surgeries. 
as a maxillofacial surgeon, you know, uh, the cases today is cases, I guess, the, the neurofibroma and the rhinoplasties are, aesthetics is the essence. And as a maxillofacial surgeon, aesthetics is an integral part of our training. May it be a tooth-related aesthetics or a face-related aesthetics, but aesthetics is something which we strive to achieve at the end of the day. May it be pathology, may it be anomaly, may it be carcinoma, may it be malignant, non-malignant, anything. But at the end of the day, when we do the treatment, we are wondering about the aesthetics. I will give you an example. Uh, when, we, when we repair our floor of the orbit, so that the scar should not see, should not be shown outside, we go transconjectival. We go into the eye and go into the floor of the orbit. Okay. Another example, when we are operating in the nasoethmoidal area, uh, ethmoidal orbital areas, this is the area, but we start somewhere from here, from the coronal incision, so that that scar should not be seen and should be hidden. You know, we, we take a lot of, lot of uh, difficulties to hide those scars, and this is the integral part of our training. And I'm sure that as a maxillofacial surgeon, we are the, probably the best ones, probably the only ones, to deal with the anomalies of face, to deal with the pathologies of face, may it be, may it be trauma, may it be ankylosis, may it be orthognathic surgery, may it be craniofacial uh, anomalies, may it be cleft palate, whatever. Yeah, probably this is the area which is which is which is growing, and in next few years, I am sure this will grow many folds. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. <coughs> Clinical photography for aesthetic facial surgery. How is it different? There are various uh, mm, uh, aspects of photography. You can do so many things like, uh, you know, uh, scenic photography, candid shots, uh, existing light photography, child photography, insect photography, photojournalism, so on and so forth. You cannot apply the same principles of uh, various aspects of photography to clinical photography because what you want and what you're looking at in terms of clinical photography is certain specifics. Now, if you're doing photography for aesthetics, for that matter, the pre-operative picture that you take and the post-op picture in terms of standardization should match. You can't have a picture of uh, the entire person and a close-up picture of a face like that to compare. The next picture that you take, if you take a picture like this, has to be almost identical in terms of the composition, the lighting, the posture, so on and so forth, the exposure, everything. Now, how is it different is what I said. It has to be standardized for every kind of a clinical shot that you take. Let us say you want a preoperative picture for aesthetics, it has to be in a certain way. If you're taking pictures intraoperatively, operative shots, you have to orient the camera in a certain way. You can't take a picture coming like that from top and you're operating, and when you project it, you don't even know from where to look at it. You know, whether it's taken from below, above, down, side, you do not know. So you need to standardize those shots. Now look at these pictures. This is also not something that you want in aesthetic facial surgery. I mean, you can take these shots, but uh, at the end of it, you need a shot in different angles, different perspectives, and those have to be the same. Now, this is what I said. You need to follow two basic tenets, the standardization and optimization of lighting. The standardization of pictures. Now, look at these pictures. If you take pictures of the frontal oblique profile view and the profile views, you need to standardize them in such a way that you need to adjust your camera, the distance that you take should be very similar to the pre and post. So if you have, I'm not going to the issues of uh, cameras, equipment, I'm talking about composition essentially. So look at these pictures, these are the three views. Right? Now look at these uh, pictures. When you take pictures for clinical shots, 
you need to enhance the problem that you are looking at. So if you have, let us say, an issue of a swelling, how you do that is uh, the interplay of lights and shadows. So if you have a camera with a flash inbuilt on top flash, this will never produce a three-dimensional effect. So if you want to produce pictures with a 3D effect, you need to do multiple lights. So if you have to do multiple lights, you need to understand the interplay of lights and shadows. So you can increase the intensity of one flash, decrease the intensity of the other, and you have a flash coming from the front as well to soften the shadows. You can't have harsh shadows as well. So it's, 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 a, it's a different ball game altogether. But nevertheless, if you want good pre and post op pictures, you want to enhance the, the effects, uh, effects of your surgery, it's best that you have the best pictures. Now, look at all these pictures and look at this one. The pictures that you saw earlier were taken by me and this is, uh, these are two pictures that I borrowed from uh, my orthodontic colleagues. By all means, you would think that this is a good picture if I don't point it out. But you see, there's an element of a shadow on one side. There is no clarity to this picture. There is no three-dimensional effect to this shot as compared to what you see here. You see basically the contours, the glistening surfaces, the shadow effects, and that's what gives the, the 3D effect to your picture. And it, it's pretty obvious when you see these pictures. You see the lighting here? There is dual lighting here, and there is, this is a picture that is coming with a flash straight onto your face, and this does not produce that 3D effect. And neither does it enhance the kind of surgery that you've done. This is a square face correction, and this is made more oval. However, you don't appreciate that much. Now, this is, again, a square face correction. You see the lighting is not adequate enough, although it is coming from two sources, at two different angles, you don't have an illumination of the sides of the face. So we are, we are going into more advanced kind of photography if you're dealing with uh, aesthetic surgery. Now, this is what I say uh, a 3D effect that is produced. Although the angles are maybe bizarre, but nevertheless, you see the lighting in this picture is coming from three flashes. And you can use multiple lights. You don't need cable for that. You can ut utilize what is called uh, 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 it's got a, all the flashes today have got what is called a slave sensor. So you can actually trigger off flashes that comes from the main source from your camera and you can trigger off multiple flashes to give that particular effect. You can produce backlit, side lit, multiple lights, top lights and the front uh, flash as well. So you will produce this kind of uh, 3D effect. You can see the glitter on the hair and that's the kind of uh, picture and this is something that's come only from the front. You need to have that equipment, you need to, have, you need to study about magnification, you need to have a standardization in terms of the distances that you use, because you can actually, t today you can have zoom lenses, and you can uh, take a picture of a person, uh, say even 50 feet away, as a portrait. But then, the, the saturation, the clarity of that picture, when you actually magnify, you would have lost. So it's best that you have a fixed distance. For instance, you have, uh, say, a, 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 a meter or two, and a fixed distance for the camera. You can have the camera on the tripod. You can have flashes on your tripods. And then you have a standardized shot of all your preoperative and postoperative pictures. Lighting, as I said, is important. You can use multiple lights. I'm not going to the details of that. And composition, for example. There are people who just pick the uh, mobile and take a picture. The mobile is just held at an angle, and when you view the picture, you don't even know how to hold the, the frame because it's important to understand there is something called a frame. And your picture has to be, if you look at parallels and perpendiculars, the picture of your face in a particular frame has to be either parallel to the sides of that particular frame. So even if you're taking a clinical shot intraoperatively, don't take it from bizarre angles because you won't be able to orient your picture on the screen. You won't be able to orient yourself to see that picture on the screen. So if, if you're looking at it, 
look at it the way your eyes see it. Just imagine if I'm suspended upside down and asked uh, to look at a, a neck dissection uh, or, or even an osteotomy. It's like doing a, a filling in the maxillary teeth with a, with a mouth mirror. You know how difficult it is in the, in the beginning to do uh, a cavity cutting with uh, the mouth mirror because you're looking at it at a different angle. Similarly, you imagine your picture the way you would otherwise look at. You do not want to look at an individual from the sides. So that's the way the framing and the composition has to be done. So composition is important. The number of views that you take for aesthetic facial surgery, for instance. I'll come to that in a minute. Subject position. The positioning is very important because people ask the patient to just sit down and take a picture. Because the normal position, the position of rest is important because you probably might see in some of my pictures as well. Because the moment you take the picture, the patient would have moved the head up. You know, the extension flexion has to be controlled. So, uh, if you go by the orthodontic point of view, the Frankfurt horizontal plane should be almost parallel to the floor when you take any sort of a picture, be it in any projection. And that's the natural head position, I guess, Dr. Sidhu. So, that's the normal head position. So, if you want to compare it with the next picture that you take after your procedure, the head has to be in the same position. So, that's subject position. Camera orientation is, again, very, very, very important. You can take a picture of uh, an object from the top. It will give actually a bird's, bird's eye view. And that actually distorts the proportions of the face. So if you want a picture which is ideal in terms of the proportions, it has to come at the level of the nose. The picture has to come, the camera lens has to come at the level of the nose. Not even a little higher, nor lower. It will automatically distort the proportions of the face. So if you have a picture that is taken from a basal view, like a worm's eye view, and then you're comparing it with a bird's eye view, there is no comparison whatsoever. So camera orientation is very important. Camera and subject level that I said again. Now fill the frame. I don't want to take a picture of Dr. Amit Biharlal here of his face if I want. I can't be taking a picture of him, uh, the entire composition where he is there in the picture completely. You, you can't take a picture like that and then zoom it and crop it because you lose saturation, you lose clarity. So if you want a picture of the face, have a standardization of the shot that you take in terms of how much of the face that you're going to incorporate in that frame. And essentially fill the frame, essentially fill the frame with the, uh, the subject that you want. Now, background. Now this is important. Uh, I think I have a few pictures that were sent to me by Dr. Dai Shankar. I'll show those. And what I mean by background, uh, essentially what I mean by standardization. Now, background is very important. You can't have a, a clinical shot of a patient sitting on a dental chair with a background of two people standing there, uh, uh, a kidney tray seen in the background, and uh, somebody is holding a green uh, curtain Part of it is not seen. You can see that person's hands in the uh, frame on the background. You know, that, that disturbs the eye and that does not focus on the issue of interest. So you need to have a background, which is a plain background. It could be of any color. But having said that, a good blue or a deep purple or even a black background or a white background is something that should be acceptable. When I say a background, there are several things, again, when you look at a background. If you have a dark background, the shadow that is thrown onto the background is not seen in your frame. But if you have a white background, you will see shadows that come up on the frame. You can see that there is a shadow there because this, the background is pretty close to the subject. And that's the shadow that you see there, right? You can see a shadow here as well. So. When you look at these pictures, you don't have shadows. Look at that. So this is something that you need to look at. So I have more or less tried to cover all these aspects in terms of lighting, profile shots, standardization of these profile shots. You can look at these two pictures. Now, this is a picture taken by me, and this is a picture taken by somebody else. Now see the difference in, in clarity of this shot. This is probably because the picture was taken, the entire bust of the individual, and then 
we have zoomed in to crop into this particular frame. So automatically you lose, you lose the saturation, you can see it in the eyes. There is no clarity of this picture whatsoever. Now, this is again uh, multiple lights. You see the difference in, in the skin tone. Of course, you have something called uh, a Photoshop to actually play around with. But if you're dealing with hundreds and thousands of patients, and if you're dealing with tens of thousands of pictures, I don't think you have the time, the patience to actually go back and do Photoshop. If you have a frame that is standardized, you don't have to do anything. Believe me, I don't have the time nor the patience to actually crop pictures. I just select something from here and there. And that's because the standardization in terms of the composition is done. I just have to put the P in first and I have a picture like this. So look at that. So this is before and after. But you see how it enhances the effect of surgery that you have done because of also multiple lights that are used and shadow effects and a 3D effect that you can get. Now, composition views, as I said. So, you have the following views. For aesthetic facial surgery, you need to take the following views. A frontal, absolutely frontal. When you say frontal, you make the patient look straight with the Frankfurt horizontal plane parallel to the floor and make sure when you look at the ears from the front, that's the one which will give you an indication. This mic is giving trouble. Uh, that's the one which will give you an indication of rotation of the head. So if you look, don't look at the face, look at the ears from the frontal projection. And ear should be seen uniformly on the two sides. Even if there is a centimeter excess of ear that is seen as compared to the other, that means the head is rotated to one side. So either you move, or best you ask the patient to move, but then that's when it takes time because there are times when you position the patient, you're about to shoot and he moves, he or she moves. So there are some technical difficulties about doing this, but nevertheless, you have to be sometimes quick in taking pictures. Sometimes when you ask the patient to take the picture on smile, patients smile and generally when the patient smile, they have a tendency to either tilt the head or smile by extending the head. You know, generally, when you smile, you don't stand stiff and smile like that, right? So when you smile, it's a basically an expression. So you automatically have that expression where you kind of move your head to the sides or extend and smile. So that's very difficult again, but then you need to position the patient well. So that's a frontal view. Left oblique view is you have a straight line here and a straight line here. So it's exactly between the 90 degrees. So you take a profile picture of a patient, uh, left or right oblique profiles. So you take a frontal projection, you take a left oblique, you take a right oblique, and you take an absolute left, left profile and a right profile. So those are one, two, three, four, and five. So you have five views. And at times, you may need what is called basal views. So again, basal views, if you look at, you can take three basal views, one, two, and absolute basal view. So you can, those are basically what we call the occipital mental projection views, 1530 and uh, 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 full basal projection. So you can have five plus three shots, depending on what you want. But then, when you take these shots preoperatively, make sure you have taken the same shots postoperatively as well. So that is standardization of the number of views that you do, depending on the case. For an aesthetic case, we need certain views. For others, we don't. So you, you, you plan accordingly. Now occlusion. And, and, and the same views, the frontal, oblique, lateral, full profile views, all of these views, you need to take them also in smile. So you have, a, you have five pictures or four pictures. Hello. Hello. Increase the volume. Hello. So you have the volume is too low. Hello. 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 So so you have you have let us say five pictures in the frontal, oblique and profile projections. You need to do the same pictures in smile as well. If you standardize that, you will have five shots this way, five in the base uh, three in the basal views, eight, and eight in smile as well. So you have sixteen shots, right? And if you're taking intraoral views, you need to have the intraoral views in terms of what you look at in terms of the occlusion. So you have a similar three views, frontal, lateral, left and right. 
and you can have these views sometimes in 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 occlusion as well as off occlusion depending on what you're trying to depict and this again you need to standardize and standardize it according to your needs but then these views are a must for a given case these views are a must for a given case post operatively as well because there are times we are at a loss to show a projection or a picture of or a clinical situation because we don't have good post op pictures and that's the reason i essentially do photography myself but then it takes away a lot of your time but having said that if you do your pictures well and if you standardize and get people to do it i think it's more or less like surgery you are uh, replicating what your uh, teachers do so these are some of the views in occlusion you also can take pictures uh, where the orthodontist will take generally pictures with a mirror to give the arch dimension to show the width of the arch the the problems in the palate sometimes or even even the the irregularities of uh, the teeth uh, in position in the arch so you can take those shots as well with an occlusal mirror so you have 3 plus 2 five shots now these are some uh, just to show you the uh, projection that's the frontal view this is a left oblique profile i mean these are all pictures before and after surgery but then this is just to illustrate a point that you have need to take these views this is a uh, right oblique profile this is a uh, full profile now when you take when you take a left or a right profile there are people who take pictures where the patient is looking more towards the right so the area of interest in a profile picture is something that is in front of this line this is not of interest for us so this is something that is of interest so anything that is in front of it there are pictures that i see where the patient has turned beyond a point so basically you see what is the lateral aspect of the face more than the area of interest the key to this is when you position your camera number one as i said the position of the lens has to be at the level of the nose or this level that is at the zygomatic cheek projection level make sure that any camera is at that level whichever camera it is so it has to be at that level and make sure that when you look through your lens to get an absolute perfect profile you should be able to see the opposite eye lash across the nasal pyramid so across the nasal pyramid you see the eye lash and that is the right profile whether it is left or right so that's the key when you take the profile projection the camera lens and the opposite eye lash it's only the eye lash that you should see not the entire eye so you can see these pictures that are standardized before and after this is another basal view now what i was trying to tell you with the interplay of lights and shadows is with these images this is the facial asymmetry now this can be enhanced may not be the perfect one but nevertheless i'm trying to illustrate a point that you can actually have an interplay of lights for which you need to study the intensity of lights that you're using to produce those shadows which will enhance that interior border so if you have certain lights which are more powerful on the top and less subtle from below you will have a subtle shadow as i'm saying a subtle shadow not a strong shadow that will mar the effect of what you're trying to do so you need to have stronger lights from top imagine it's just a interplay of lights to get the shadows so if you have harsh lights you will produce flattening and there's no shadow effect at all so you have two light sources coming from the top and a subtle one coming from below you will have a very subtle shadow that is produced at the interior border and it will take time for you to you need to experiment and it's pretty easy today because it's it's the world of digital photography so you can take 100 pictures and you have you're never at a loss because the times that i used to experiment with pictures it used to be with uh, prints and slides for which 36 exposure film with slide would cost me 1000 bucks for every 36 frame film so today it is pretty easy you can use uh, you can take the picture 100 times and you're not paying anything much for it uh, now look at these occlusal views look at these views with the frontal right and left and 
that's the mirror view of the uh, the occlusal aspect of the maxillary mandibular teeth. Now, these are clinical shots. Just to give you an idea, now this ear that you see and this genioplasty that you see and this rhinoplasty that you see. If you take a picture from different angles, you will not appreciate this kind of uh, uh, work that is going on there. So, you need a picture that comes exactly from the front, not from an angle, from any of these angles. So, that is why I put these clinical shots. Now, the ear, the way you look at the ear as the patient is lying down. So, you need to hold the camera in a plane that will give a ear that would otherwise be seen as a ear, not at a different angle. I hope you understand what I am trying to say. Same thing here, genioplasty. Do not take a picture from somewhere somebody sh above somebody's shoulder. Take time, move into the field, get all the surgeons out of the way and then make a picture like this, which is absolutely straight in the frame. Do not tilt the camera. So, what I am trying to say is the margins of the frame should coincide with the margins of the procedure and that is when you will get the ideal shot. For instance, if this uh, uh, frontal view of the occlusion is taken at an angle, you do not get that perspective at all whatsoever. So, look at this, these are clinical shots. So, we went to composition views, now we are looking at uh, background, you can take uh, backgrounds, lighter backgrounds or darker backgrounds, I prefer to take uh, pictures on a dark background because it basically you know shows up, it enhances the subject much more than anything else and it, it uh, uh, does not distract the eye from looking at the background because you are looking at the face and the illumination and the three dimensional effect. And uh, that is what you see an enhancement of that particular face which is this is a case where the facial lengthening has been done and you can see how you can enhance that. In fact, you can enhance it even better if you have a still cross slit from the uh, right posterior side. So, you can actually illuminate that margin to give that particular effect and this is a better one I guess. So, these are something to do with uh, background, this is the basal view, look at this. Now, this is a picture, uh, you can now distinctly tell if I have taken this shot or not. So, this is a shot with a white background and you can see some shadow effects and this is a shot you can see actually light coming from top as well here. So, you can actually use multiple lights to give this particular effect as compared to this, because this gives sort of a direct flash burnt effect and so it flattens the image. And again, the background is also important. This enhances according to me, I do not know if orthodontic books subscribe to black backgrounds because I think books generally say it should be a white background. Look at this and that. This is a terrible background to use. So, use either plain backgrounds, be it white or you know grays or blues or black, whatever it should be a plain background. And that is again, uh, you see the saturation here, you see the clarity here, you look at the, the, the pixelization of this margin here and this sharpness here. This is an enlarged view of a bust shot probably taken. And again, you look at the background as well. <coughs> this is an enhanced shot with uh, multiple flashes. You can see how how brightly this face is lit up, and actually exaggerates the effects that you have. Uh, so, to conclude, a good understanding of the sense of lighting, the interplay of multiple lights, and the production of desirable shadows is imperative to produce uh, three-dimensional effects. Good composition is mandatory for optimal and standard pictures for proper evaluation and diagnosis. It is for documentation, evaluation results and a futuristic reference. And I go back to the same basic tenets, standardization, standardization and standardization, standardization of lighting, frames, projections, views, everything needs to be standardized. Thank you for your attention. This is also one of my abstract shots on the on your right. <laughs>